Hey, welcome back to the Common Ground North Dakota podcast. I'm Heather. And I'm Jen. I've been a chef for 10 years. And I'm a registered dietitian. We've all heard the saying, farm to table. But what if the conversation was table to farm? Join Jen and I as we sit down with ag experts to dig in and find out more about North Dakota agriculture. Welcome back to Common Ground North Dakota with Heather and Jen. Hello, hello. So what did you think about our last guest? I loved it. I knew I was going to love it. I know. We we talked with Marcha from Cows & Co. She was great. And, I, and her story, like just how they came here, what she's right. been able to build. Yep. And the fact that we have something of that stature in North Dakota is so cool. I know. The only one, was she saying, like well, that uses her like, own milk yes. to make the product. Yep, the on-site creamery, right. and I loved like how she just kept chasing her dream, mm-hmm. like of being involved in in the operation, and like how she started as a nurse, and then yeah. like wanted to be involved in that, and Took it's really just cool. And and there was like that bridge. I feel like from her European background right. to North Dakota, she's been able mm-hmm. to connect those two so well, and continues to grow. Mm-hmm. You know, we have our dream of the away spa I right mean, the, yes we're going there we're well going and then there. our concern was is there enough milk for right. her to grow and she said there, there was is. but today we're gonna really find out yeah so we have pete van badaf hi pete with hi. us yes and pete is a dairy the, farmer the cow expert yeah what's your title say. what do you call yourself uh, we'll go with dairy farmer okay nice. okay okay i'm not gonna call myself an expert in anything <laughs> Well, an expert with us. <laughs> yes, you are. Sure, for sure. sure. You, you can answer us. a lot of our questions, I'm sure. So thanks for joining us today. We have a lot of questions because we were talking to your sister about her gelato and we were really concerned about, is there going to be enough milk to <laughs> make the level and the amount of gelato that our friends and us are going to eat? Because it was a lot of milk <laughs> that they use of yours, Pete. When she was telling us yep. about the Gouda. Yeah, they, it's a, they use a good amount of milk, yeah. Okay. How many cows do you have? Let's start with that. Yeah. Uh, milking 1,600 cows uh, in total on the farm, 3,000 calves, heifers, and cows. Oh, my. So that would, we uh, raise all of our own uh, heifers on our farm that then will uh, come into the milking herd when they have their first calf. Uh, so, yeah, like, like I said, around 3,000 total. 3,000. Okay. And I remember... Marcha telling us that your parents had 50 when they were in the Netherlands and now you have yep. 3000. That's incredible. Yeah. So they had uh, 50 milking cows in the Netherlands. So probably around uh, 200, okay. a little under 200 cows on the, on the farm in the Netherlands. Yeah. So, wow. and you went from the Netherlands to Canada, Canada to but, North Dakota. Did the cows come with you from Canada or did you just leave those there? Uh, so from the Netherlands to uh, Canada, we didn't bring any, bring any of okay. the cows. But from when we moved from Canada to uh-huh. the United States, we brought some of our younger heifers. So heifers under maybe a year of age. Okay. Because we didn't we didn't start uh, milking immediately when we got here. The farm that we're on now was uh, built from the ground up. Wow. So we b- brought some of our heifers to then raise them so that they, they could come into the milking herd when they calved and in theory then the farm would be built by then so that's kind wow. of the reasoning why why we didn't bring all of the cows i guess okay yeah. and what kind of cows are they uh, we have uh, mainly holstein uh, we do have some so there's black and white holstein red mm-hmm. and white holstein Mo- most of our cows are black and white holsteins okay we do have a few red and white holsteins and uh, a handful of brown swiss uh, just another another dairy breed we those were some of the the heifers that we brought from Canada were brown Swiss and okay. we uh, we've always continued to uh, breed them back to uh, brown Swiss bulls. Okay, just uh, just keep to the keep the bloodline uh, little, going. Yeah, keep it and keep it a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Just st- they stand out in the herd. Everybody loves sure. the brown Swiss. Oh they're yeah, more, I love the name more. even. It reminds me of chocolate milk, but right. honestly, it that's does. not where chocolate milk comes from, right, Pete? Yeah, <laughs> I it's get that not from the bro- Yeah, I'm sure it's not the brown <laughs> Swiss cows. That's just a you know, yes, a yes. breed. We know. So, is the milk <laughs> different between the two the, the two breeds? And it is a little bit different. So, and generally, a Holstein will produce a little bit more milk. Okay, and a brown Swiss will produce a little bit higher butterfat protein. So a little bit oh. less milk, but a little bit higher components. But it's 
the Brown Swiss and our herd, they're pretty comparable to our Holsteins. They're very similar. Do you okay. keep the milk separate? We don't. Okay. No. You just okay. mix it all up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, feeding that volume yeah, of cows. Yeah, 3,000 cows. What first are they of all, do they, uh, Are they out on pasture mostly and grass fed or are you feeding them grain? Is there a special special feed that you feed cows? So our, our cows are all housed in, in barns in North Dakota. It's not, it, it's difficult to have cows on pasture in North yeah. Dakota to, be, to begin with, even for the short time that we have uh, mm-hmm. nice weather right. during the summer. Very true. But we uh, we feed a it's called a mixed total mixed ration, and we there's uh, several different ingredients. So the the main ingredients are corn silage, okay. which is grown locally. We grow our, ourselves. We also work with uh, several of our neighboring farmers who purchase manure from us and grow silage for us. Okay. okay. North Dakota has a lot of uh, uh, egg products that they're making throughout the state, and all those products have byproducts mm-hmm. which are not usable they're essentially waste but they're able to be fed to cows mm-hmm. okay so we feed uh, for example there's a pasta plant in carrington mm-hmm. we feed uh, wheat mids which is a byproduct from making pasta uh, we feed durham flour that's uh, not quite the quality for human consumption but still mm-hmm. good quality we, we're able to feed that to our cows mm-hmm. there's an ethanol plant in spirit wood we yep. feed corn distillers from that plant so after they they uh, go through the process there. Corn distillers, distillers is left over. We can feed that to our cows. We feed beet bulb from the Red River Valley. Wow. Uh, we have we a lot of ties. They've got a good diet. I'm like, because that yeah. beet, if you mix that beet pulp with that pasta, I mean, that's a really nice dish. I mean, right. Yes. And I <laughs> love that the partnership of with you and the other growers and the people in here that you're working back. together. It ties back. It's like a circle. Like mm-hmm. you're using the byproducts. It goes into the feed. It feeds the cows and then you get the milk. Right. Yeah. And then you make the gelato and cheese. Yes. Like it's just, yes. Mm. And then we, we work with a nutritionist. So a nutritionist comes on our farm every two weeks, uh, looks at the cows, um, looks at milk production. Are there components, butter, fat, protein, uh-huh. uh, looks at heifers we want to make sure that they're growing but they're not getting fat looking at cows that are dry that are going to calve to make sure that they're getting the nutrients they need that they're not getting too big that they're not too skinny that they're able to transition well into milk production he's testing all those feeds and then uh, formulating rations for each group of cows on our farm to make sure that every group of cows is getting the the right nutrients that they need wow every so he's two like, weeks he's the cow version of me well, right. Like, and that's awesome. How lucky are those cows? I feel like yeah. as humans, we're not checking in with our diets every two weeks. Are we? Well, well some, <laughs> I recommend it. But, you know, <laughs> and it seems like he's doing body composition on cows. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what you're saying, right? Like, you don't want them yeah. to get fat. You want, like, good lean muscle. So you need amino acids and, like, testing the feed. Like, we're really scientists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had one client call me a... a um chemistry or a chemist oh wow jen's a jen's a dietitian so i am if you I, need a backup one I mean, her call. <laughs> what could be so different <laughs> but this makes sense to me all the work that you go into keeping yeah. your cows healthy that's why the milk's so good yes it, it doesn't yeah. just happen you're you're really putting in the time and effort to that's get amazing. a quality product yeah, if you want the cows to thrive, you have to give them the the right tools to thrive. You have to make sure that they're comfortable, that they have good quality feeds. Yeah, really takes a combination of a lot of things to to keep the cows as uh, healthy and comfortable as possible. And the yeah, the better the cows are doing, the more milk they produce in theory, and the better quality the milk is. So that's what we're shooting for. Nice. So, Pete, is it true that um, like at the volume that you're milking cows, do they just automatically know when it's time to milk? And do you have an automatic operation where they'll be like, all right, every day at 9 a.m., Betty the cow is going in to get milked and she just knows and she goes in, hooks up, and then is done? Like, is that how it actually works? I don't know. I just kind of so, made that up. So we uh, <laughs> we don't milk with robotics on our farm, but okay. we do have uh, milking equipment. Okay. Uh, so we, we have a group, we have 10 groups of cows okay. in our barns and they come to the milking parlor one group at a time okay. and we milk our cows three times a day. So in theory, about eight hours apart, we're milking about 22 hours a day Oh my! and the other two hours are spent washing the parlor. But you, 
the cows know when it's when it's uh, time for them to go to the parlor. You mm-hmm. can see which pen is next because they're waiting at the gate for somebody to come open the gate for them. Ah, cows are, cows are very uh, they're very used used to routine, so yep. they they uh, they know what time that they're supposed to get milked, and then they go eat and lay down and get back up and eat, and they know what time their fresh feed is coming in the morning, so they're waiting for their feed at the feed bunk. They're they're very. Uh, routine they, they want to be uh, they want to have everything as consistent as possible i mean and that's like a nutritionist dream and dietitian's dream it's like consistency consistency yeah. every is day important. the same this is exactly what and you're controlling that environment i just love everything about it okay wait you said 22 hours a day so that's a lot of time who's doing that do you is a human being do you need to be there to do the process yeah, so we have uh, people are on the farm 24-7. Uh, they're day crew and a night crew in the night. So we're always milking with three people. And then one person is bringing the cows back and forth from the pens to the milking parlor. And then when the cows are being milked, their pens are being cleaned. Okay. So three times a day, their pens are cleaned. We So it's we milk in a, what's called a double 24 parallel parlor. So we can milk 48 cows at a time. They're essentially, you'd be in a... The people are standing a little bit lower, so they have access with their hands mm-hmm. right by the udders. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then there's uh, two lines of cows that they'll come in single file and turn sideways next to each other. So there's, in theory, 24 cows standing side by side on either side of the milking pit. Okay. And then 24 cows are cleaned, wiped, attached. Mm-hmm. And uh, milking is automatic when the milk production of the cow gets down to a certain point. We don't want to milk them all the way empty. Okay. Then the machine the machine comes off automatically. They're post dipped, so to, we put a a dip on their teats to protect their teats while they're in their pen, so they're That's not nice. picking up bacteria. Mm-hmm. And when the whole row of twenty four is done, a gate lifts up, and then the next group of twenty four will come in. So we the shifts are from five to five, but our milking shifts in theory are from one to eleven, and then again from one to eleven. Wow. wow. That's a lot. That's commitment. And I'm, yeah. like Christmas Day, right? Every, Doesn't Thanksgiving. Change. You don't have no. a vacation. You got to milk them. Well, the cows are always being milked. Yeah. Yep. Why is Doesn't it that matter. you don't take all the milk out? You said you leave some of the milk. What is So if, if you're over milking a cow, you can cause mastitis and you can cause damage oh. to the teat end. So mm-hmm. you, oh, um, okay. That makes sense. Oh, there's so much behind it. And you've, there is. you've just learned this working on the farm or where does all this knowledge come from? Uh, well, the majority, vast majority is uh, is uh, on the farm learning, but I did go to uh, uh, BSc in Bismarck for two years and I graduated from NDSU with an ag economics degree. Oh, wow. But the majority of uh, of what I do or what I know is uh, learned on the farm, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing. On the, on the job training. And when you were little growing up on the farm with the cows and the dairy. Is that something you thought, oh, I want to do this when I get older? Uh. I think, yeah, from a young age, always, always uh, have been interested in, in the cows, but I, mm-hmm. it was, probably wasn't until I was 16, 17 years old that I was really serious about wanting to uh, work on the farm af- after school. Okay. But yeah, as, as kids, I'd, I have, yeah, really enjoyed always being on the farm, playing mm-hmm. on the farm, the cows, and I have two, uh, two sons that are three and one, and they, oh. I mean, you can even, even, you know, from five six months old they're excited about cows oh i'm sure it's in the family yes what a way to grow up i know so how far does your milk travel so we know you use some at cows and co we know you use some but you said you have plenty of milk so where does the other milk go the the majority of our milk goes to fargo to cask lake creamery okay um, and then at that point, it's uh, bottled. All of our milk goes into fluid milk, so a gallon, half gallon, okay. uh, some into pints, I think. But the majority are gallon, half gallon bottles, whole milk, two percent, one percent, skim, uh, probably cream, mm-hmm. maybe a few other other things. And then mm-hmm. from that point, it's going mainly North Dakota, some into Minnesota, some into South Dakota, but most of the milk from Casfle goes into North Dakota oh, all across right. the state. That's amazing. And like Midwest and kind yes. of staying here. Mm-hmm. And so how much milk are you producing? Uh, on a on a 24-hour day, about 145,000 pounds of milk. 
were producing a day. Uh, wow. Milk is in, not sure why, but they, they calculate it in pounds. pounds? They do. I thought you were going to say sure. gallons. And okay. is it like weight, like weight then? Like it's weight. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. suppose that's the easiest mm -hmm. to weigh it. Okay. So, so cast clay, your milk goes there and to the gelato and cheese. Yes. Nowhere else. Those are the only places. Those are the two places. Yeah. Okay. Do you keep yeah. any for yourself at all? Do you have your own stash? No, we, we buy milk at the store just, just okay. like everybody else. Okay. <laughs> but always cast clay milk. Though. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gotta support, right? Yes, yes. Gotta support I like your own business. Clay. I do too. Milk. Now I know why. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. for We've sure. been shipping milk to Casclay since we uh, moved here and started milking in 2009. And always, wow. all of our milk has always went to Casclay. Oh wow! So it's been a great partnership. Yes. Yep. That's awesome. I love it. So um, we probably have so many questions about like I love the animal ones. You know, like so you said that you don't milk the cows right away that when they came over from Canada, you weren't milking them right away. So how long does it take from the time that they're born to like when you would decide to start so we, milking them? We uh, uh, start breeding our heifers at around 13 months of age, depending on okay. uh, what size they are. So mm -hmm. we want them to be uh, close to mature when mm -hmm. they have their calf so that they're they're able to transition well into milk production mm -hmm. and it's a nine month gestation period, just like a, a person. Okay. So at around uh, 22, 23, 24 months of age, mm -hmm. that's when they would have their first calf and okay. they would uh, go into milk production at that point. Okay. And who's in charge of calving? Cause how many calves are you having yeah. each year? Uh, it varies, but around five a day is the average for us. And we're, we're calving year round. So wow. we're always, always calving. How about twins? How often, because I'm a twin, Pete, I have to ask, I'm like, how okay. often do you have twins? Uh, it's, it happens, but it's pretty rare. Maybe okay. I, I can't give you a stat, but it's less yeah. than one in 10 or one in 20 or one in oh, okay. 30, maybe even it's not, doesn't happen very often. Okay. And is there a vet out there that's helping you or do you just do that on your own? We, we do work with a vet out mm -hmm. of Jamestown. Um, okay. She has more of an oversight role on our farm mm -hmm. so she pres prescribes our medications um we visit with her if we have things to that we're concerned about that we mm -hmm. need to look at but we have uh four five one is on vacation at the moment her what we call our herdsmen okay they're they're um essentially just like veterinarians so they they're here from mexico through a visa they do all of our herd work on the farm so they're breeding our cows doing any vet checks uh treating cows that need to be treated, mm -hmm. uh, breeding cows, correct checking cows. Uh, the only thing we really don't do is if, if we have, uh, for example, a C-section mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and we would call our vet for that. We don't do surgeries on, mm -hmm. on the farm, but everything else is done in house by mm -hmm. our guys. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. It's a big job. And, yeah. And they're one of them is here 24 seven. So typically two people in the day, one mm -hmm. person in the night. So there's always somebody available immediately mm -hmm. if uh, a cow is a difficult calving mm -hmm. or if a cow needs to be treated or whatever it might be. Yep. I noticed like with our herd, do you have cows that have different personalities too? Like there's leaders of each yeah. like pack. Do you have that? And do yeah. they come in in the same order? <laughs> These are all my I, questions. Th there's definitely cows that are, would be boss cows. Yeah. That they want to be first in the parlor. They're mm -hmm. always first at the gate. Mm -hmm. They want to get back to their feed first mm -hmm. and then there's cows that are just hanging out there yeah always always last always in the pen. last sure and particularly the the brown swiss they're more friendly than the rest they're they always and very curious they want to oh. see what's going on if you're if you're doing something that's not like, that you're not typically doing in a like fixing a gate or something yeah. in the pen there they'll be there and within minutes to check you out and oh. lick you really and, oh I like the brown Swiss. I know. I kind of need one for my friend Galahad. He's <laughs> yeah. a mini horse. Yes, Maybe that'll be buddy. my next pet for him. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other brown Swiss in North Dakota? Uh, I think there are. Yes. There are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. when you when you increase your cows, where where do you go? Where, where would I go buy some? Where would I get some cows? Um, so we're we never buy cows. So we're, we're able to with the heifers being born on our farm, uh, keep our herd at the size that we're at now and we don't have any plans for expansion okay um 
when we did start here, we purchased a lot of heifers from some came from Minnesota, some mm-hmm. from South Dakota, Nebraska, kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. But uh, since we probably the last five to 10 years, we haven't purchased any any cows or heifers. We're able to keep the herd at the size we're at now with the heifers being born on our farm. Nice. Okay. And you don't sell any either. You keep them all there. So we, we do sell any bull calves and we so we're breeding uh, with what's called sorted semen so they're able to sort females from males so that we can target our higher genetic animals on our farm to get females to get heifers out of those to more quickly improve our genetics okay and everybody else is bred to beef so we're breeding with limousine and angus Mm -hmm. because all of those calves will go for beef Mm -hmm. they're uh, sold to two farms and then they're raised up to 1200 13 1400 pounds kind Mm -hmm. of very similar to a a beef animal would be i guess they go into a feedlot typically Mm -hmm. okay and and yeah then they they become hamburger and steaks Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we're able to we're able to uh kind of predict how many heifers we need and through the sorted semen where that's how we keep our we don't want to overproduce heifers because we don't want to raise extra heifers that we don't need coming back into the herd essentially is why we're doing that Huh. So that's where I got my 4-H cows. And you mentioned you have 4-H we members do, yes. that come out and they've bathed your cows and they halter train them. That's really fun. And I bet that's so a it, great learning experience for them too. It, the majority of the kids, there, some of them do come from farms, but the majority of them are either from town or live out in the country, but don't have a lot of uh, experience with agriculture or with animals in particular. Okay. We typically, we've been doing this for quite a few years now. It's typically 10 to 20 kids from the 4-H here in town. Uh-huh. They come pick their own heifer. Uh, we have one one girl wants to do a cow this year. That's a little bit more commitment than it a is. heifer. <laughs> She's to going milk for the cow it. At. Okay. But the, mainly it's heifers. They'll pick their heifers. We put them in a separate pen. Uh, we feed them and keep them bedded up. But they uh, they train them, walk with them. Uh, clean them, bathe them, and then when it's time to go to the fair, then uh-huh. they uh, take care of them there, feed them there, and when it's done, then the heifers come back to us, and oh, wow. hopefully they uh, they get a good experience and uh, yeah, get a glimpse of uh, what animal agriculture is mm-hmm. about. They can see the farm, see how we're treating the rest of the cows, and I think those those kids will become future pro pro dairy pro yes, ag absolutely. Kids that, that can tell the the true story or the right story to uh, other kids in college or yep. even do- or the, even further down the road. That's an amazing thing that you're doing yeah. just to encourage agriculture, to teach, especially like not everybody has access to a farm, like you said, even if we live yeah. in North Dakota. So like the ability to raise that animal and care for them and understand all the work that goes into it and know where their products come from, I think is really important. Yeah, I love all these connections with your community. It sounds like right. you have so many partnerships uh, with your community. That's great. The the community has been very welcoming of of us here since we started, and we try to try to give back to when we can. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So I think we have host halftime next. Did Pete, you hear about this, Pete? Where host you ask halftime? us some questions. <laughs> I mean, you can I, ask us anything. You can ask us anything. We just need I mean, three. It's about cows. Great. Mm-hmm. But I do we're, a, I do we're a few, ready. A few questions. Okay. Um, okay. What? I wasn't really sure what kind of questions. Just but anything. There's no uh, rules. No wrong answers here. I well, mean, there's, maybe first, answers. there's wrong answers with me. <laughs> the, first, the first question I had was, uh, uh, what percentage of North Dakota dairy farms are family owned? Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Good question. What percentage? I'm going to say 65%. I put 5%. It's uh, 100% at this oh, at this point. 100%? 100% of North Dakota dairy farms are, are wow. family owned. Oh, that's and great, is that though. due to the laws that we have in North Dakota, or why is that? Uh, I think part of that, that's part of it, yes. But uh, I think North Dakota's at this point not growing in dairy as much as south dakota is or minnesota so a uh, uh, lot of uh, our size farms are smaller mm-hmm. there aren't any really very large dairy farms in north dakota and they're all 
for the most part, they're all have been family owned for a long time. Yeah. That's great. That is great. A hundred percent. Okay. What else you got for us? Uh, second question. How long does it take for milk to get to the store from once we milk the cow to when it ends up in the grocery store in the bottle where a consumer can buy it? Mm. Okay. In a, either hours or days. Oh, shoot. Five days? 12 hours. So uh, average 48 hours. That's good. Ooh. 48 hours. So they're coming out yeah. with those like metal trucks or how's that happening? Yeah. So we have uh, a local company here out of Carrington hauls all of our milk. They have two uh, trucks and trailers. They load two loads of milk every morning. Uh, they get to cask late, typically mid morning or early morning, seven, eight o'clock. They unload the milk and most days it's immediately goes to uh, processing. So they pasteurize it, separate the milk, and then it goes to bottling. And as soon as it's bottled, they start loading that on the truck and it gets distributed throughout the, wow. the area. So fresh. That's no wonder strong. you're just drinking cask clay milk. I mean, why right. not? It's, it's super yeah. fresh. Yeah. Okay. 48 hours. That's fast. All right. All right. Next question, Pete. Uh, last question uh, I had was, uh, what do you think the carbon footprint is of the U.S. dairy industry in a percentage point? Well, yours sounds really small from what you've told us. Um, Cause that's, that's kind of been a- uh, Yeah, it's a hot that's topic. a topic too. Yeah. Okay, so what percentage? Okay, I'm just, I'm just- For What percentage of total greenhouse gases come from the dairy industry in the United States kind of- Oh. Jen's mm-hmm. erasing, Jen's yeah, erasing. I, uh, okay. 3%. 2%. 2%, yeah. Oh, good job. Yes. Just like milk, too. Way to go. <laughs> right? It's like so, the, you know. Okay, so I feel like we're told it's much higher than that. But 2%, that's not a lot. That's pretty close to mm-hmm. neutral. And I, th- I think we're making uh, pretty good progress. I think in the last 50 years, yeah. we're using 20 to 30% less land, 20 to 30% less fuel, less water, less feed to make the same amount of milk and always trying to uh, improve those things yeah because it's not it's not only good for the environment but the more efficient we can be the more efficient our cows are the better it is for us as farmers as well and that's that's always our goal too absolutely constantly reinventing and yes yeah. being curious about what other what's the latest research saying and what's the yeah. latest nutrition right. information well for and look cows. into the future that's great i know so we also need to know i'm giving Jen the trophy. Just take yeah. it, Jen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she gets it. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, but before we let you go, you got to tell us about your YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, yes. We want to know about We've it. We heard you're quite popular, like 1.3 million views. I mean, that's pretty that's big. awesome. Even my kids would think that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And they're critics on YouTube, Very. let me tell you. You ask a kid and they're like, yeah. So when did you start it? What, what are you, what type of material are you putting on it? Uh, Started it, I think it was fall of 2021, so not about a, a year and a half now that I've been doing it. Uh, release a video every week, once a week, typically. Sometimes uh, I'll do a Q&A video on Sundays. Okay. So it's uh, anything that's going on on the farm, from growing the crops to uh, what's going on with the cows, things that we're mm-hmm. doing every day, breakdowns. Uh, just try to try to do something different every week, try to... And Keep behind the scenes I guess. of what's and what's yeah. the name of it? Yeah, it's uh, Pete Van Bedef, ND Dairy Farmer. Okay, awesome. Pretty, so pretty if simple we w- name. If we want to see what's going on, we can check out your YouTube channel and yeah. and really see. And got so- a part of the reason why I started it was uh, got it during COVID. We, um, mm-hmm. of course, kind of backed off on in person tours. We typically mm-hmm. are doing a lot of tours, especially for for kids here, schools, four mm-hmm. H. And during that time, we kind of cut back on that pretty significantly, but still wanted to show people that are interested and want to know what's going on on a dairy farm to be able to see that. And also from just a general consumer standpoint, um, just want to show people what we're doing. Not we're not here to hide anything Mm -hmm. we've always been open to showing people our farm. And um, yeah, I just want to show consumers uh, how we take care of the cows and what all goes into uh, producing a glass of milk or a yeah. pint of ice cream or gelato. 
That's awesome. Well, so a, a quality, right? Like, I think the the quality is like exceptional. Mm-hmm. So I that's what I love to hear is everything you're doing to make it that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're always we're always told we have to tell our story, otherwise it's told for us. And I that's think that's true. definitely true. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So. Uh, Oh God, we've learned a lot. Yes, about cows and well, we'll check out the YouTube takes. channel first, but then we're gonna have to come in person because yep. I want to sure. meet all the cows. Yeah, the brown Swiss. The brown Swiss. We want to make really friends. Sweet, we do. <laughs> so, uh, Pete, what's your favorite part about being included in like the North Dakota agriculture community? What's your favorite part of that? Uh, it's difficult to answer. I think North Dakota is very ag friendly. Very animal ag friendly they're Mm -hmm. uh very pro livestock pro ag so it's it's easy to to just enjoy being a a farmer or a dairy farmer in north dakota because you don't have um uh, yeah just easy to work with neighbors uh don't Mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, issues uh i mean there's still plenty of regulation but they're they're not overburdensome and the regulators that we do have they're good to work with they're uh, reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, they're just a very fr- egg friendly state, I guess would, would be my answer. Yeah. That's and that's awesome. true. Yeah. We hear that a lot, like with a lot of our guests and like the people, it all comes down to the people and the support that you get and the pride yeah. in your work. And we see that we yes. definitely see that and how you give back to your community. So thank you so much yes, for being thank you. on Thanks our Thanks for podcast. taking the time educating our consumers and yeah for those of you listening definitely check out pete and his youtube channel because i know i am yes say hi to all the cows for us will you i will do that (laughs) okay (laughs) awesome thank you thank you so much pete yeah no problem that was fun that is fun oh my goodness i'm gonna go buy cast clay milk after this oh for sure (laughs) that's coming in my house big gallon definitely definitely (laughs) so our next guest what what do we have coming up next so we have a rancher. Yeah. Right. But it, there's more to it. Like that's just a small piece. I guess. There's, I, yeah, there's a lot. Cause it's agritourism. Yep. I hunting. Feel like hunting. There, I think. A brewery. Yeah. You wouldn't I mean, have to ever leave the ranch. You'd no. Be good. Right. Egg tourism. It's mm-hmm. kind of getting into and bison and Angus. It sounds Angus. like we're going to learn about. So I like that. We know a little bit about cows now. I know. So we're going to ask a little more questions, maybe more in depth. Yes. Yes. So (laughs) tune in next time. Yep. Where we interview Black Leg Ranch. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Stay curious, North Dakota. Thanks for tuning in to the Common Ground North Dakota podcast. Make sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Most importantly, send us your questions about North Dakota agriculture by visiting our website. You might win a prize. We'll see you in the next episode of the Common Ground North Dakota podcast.